It's just a wonderful pleasure to introduce Dr. Dozman, which, whom we all know. We just, I just wanted to say we appreciate so much your presentation to us, your reflection on your career and how you know, you're thinking about this material uh, at the beginning and maybe near the end of your career. So it's just been a great time to have with you. And with that, I'll pray us in. Gracious God, we just look upon you as the source of all blessings for all of your people. Help us to accept those blessings. Help us to use this class to better learn about the ancestors of our faith and how the blessings that you put upon them are now coming through to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're in our last week already, you know. Goes fast. There's more Bible to read. <laughs> I just want you to know that. There's more. Um, should we get focused up on what we're doing? We're kind of going through some material that's probably familiar at some point, the ancestral material, but we're shaping it up around um, genealogy, which is how the literature is structured. It's really how late editors of the Bible want us to read this material. They don't want us to read these narratives in isolation. They want us to read them within a large genealogical structure. And when we do that, we've seen that um, narratives um, are tied to problems when you read the literature as genealogy. That is, they signify the breakdown of the genealogy. And the breakdown in a genealogy, did you read the Times this week on Japan and their birth rate? It's terrifying. It is terrifying. Talk about genealogy and its evaporation. Um, so narrative really kicks in to try to solve a problem so we can get back to the genealogy. The genealogy is what we want, even though it's boring. That's what we want. We are still doing genealogical work in the sermon series. I hope you saw that today, now that we're attuned to genealogy. We did just like these Genesis genealogies. You have, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his son. So we're doing genealogical work there. Now that, that's all quite abstract unless be, that, you know, you gotta, you gotta stay tuned for the series, but eventually we're gonna get into genealogy. It's gonna be about our death and resurrection. Resurrection to what? Into this genealogy. Yeah? That's what, that's what the Apostles' Creed is exploring. And once you're in that genealogy, I thought it was a killer sermon today. Uh, really an important sermon. Um, once you're in that genealogy, then you have allegiance problems. You see, you have allegiance problems. And you have to sort out what is really powerful and what is a, a false illusion of power. And that has to do always with the nation state. Always with the nation state. In the history of, of um, the ancient Near East and in the history of Christianity, it's always the nation state that wants religion in its back pocket because it wants to divinize its power. And religious leaders are always tempted to take the bait because there's a lot of rewards. Tie yourself into the nation state and there are treats. There's real power there. So the whole notion of where, where is your allegiance, a genealogical question ultimately. We're living that one right now. The, yeah, that's right, Goon. The Lutherans, uh, yeah. Which is a touchy business, isn't it? Another course, another time. Um, OK, you ready to move ahead with this? We, our segue into this was the, the Jesus genealogies, to show you that genealogies in the ancient world are social constructions, not biological constructions. It's very important that you see that. 
even though it's a little disconcerting, what do you mean, Tom? Well, that's just the way it is. That's how they construct these things. No one's doing their DNA like Mary and I just did. <laughs> that's also true in the book of Genesis. The characters we're studying as a family, these are independent characters. I used to teach the book of Genesis early in my career, and this is the way we, we studied at that time called tradition history. We just pulled these characters apart. They're not related. They're eponymous ancestors that are founding ancestors for different groups of people in the ancient Near East who are themselves unrelated. Somebody said, no, 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 the group is bigger than we thought, so now we got to relate to each other. Are you my third cousin, or are you what? And now we get gene. So now we have a genealogy that's defining who's in, who's at the center of being in, who's on the periphery, like Ishmael. Not in, not out. Uh, and we looked at the Abraham cycle last week that explored that. Now, this week... The Abraham cycle was the problem of infertility, breaks the genealogy, and then the problem of infertility lingered throughout the whole cycle, which gave rise to sort of band-aid approaches to getting that genealogy going again, which then becomes a highly oppressive story about slavery and Take the concubine. You can have her until she gets pregnant. Now, all of a sudden, oh, no, now there's conflict. Hmm? Today, we're going to go back. You got my hand out. I'm going to follow the text. You got another Cliff's Notes here. These texts are a lot bigger, especially the Jacob cycle, because Jacob is a huge eponymous ancestor in the ancient world. He is the founder of the, of the Bethel cult. And the Bethel cult is the main sanctuary of the northern kingdom. And he's, Jacob as a character is all over the prophetic literature. He's an extremely important character. So his cycle of stories are very complex. They include all kinds of things. That is, he's the northern ancestor. You know, we have the north, Israel, we say. And then we have the south, Judah. Jacob is the northern eponymous ancestor. Now, his stories have kind of gotten pulled into this genealogy. So it's going to follow the same motifs of the Abraham cycle, and that is barrenness, infertility. Now, if you look at the top of my handout, we could spend a semester. I used to run seminars on this, and we wouldn't get through it. This is very complicated and interesting material. But I want you to see this top little diagram I gave you. And you can see that the Jacob cycle of stories are probing ancestral relationships now in the way it's structured. The first one is the mother load event, Jacob and Esau. And we're going to look at that in detail. But then there's a second boundary genealogical episode, and that is Jacob and his northern ancestors in Haran, and that is Laban, but that goes back to the Abraham genealogy. When, Abra when Terah left Babylon, he, he traveled with, a, with somebody named, um, named Haran, and, and they're related. Well, that clan never came down. They just hung out in Damascus. They're north. So they're related. That's a relationship story. And they're going to come back in this story with Jacob. And that's going to then lead to back to the theme that starts this cycle. And that is Jacob and Esau. This is a very important genealogical relationship. Who's in? Who's out? And how do you negotiate this? Slipped in between transitionally, and we don't have time to look at this, and it's fascinating. We're going to look at one, but are these Jacob? Are these encounters Jacob has with the deity? He has one. At, he lays a rock down. You know, it's great children's stories. And the ladder goes to heaven. You know the story. And the angels are going up and down on the ladder. He's laying on the rock. That's a cult foundation story. That's how you say build the church here. 
build the church on Michigan Avenue here on the corner of, is it Oak and Chestnut or whatever it is, it's not Oak, because, because Lucy slept here one night <laughs> and had a dream. And so we built it. That's a cult founding story. And if that were the case, then Lucy is the eponymous ancestor who founds the cult. Paul's a cult founder um, of, uh, of Gentile Christianity. Moses is a cult founder. We have a bunch of them in the Bible. Jacob is one. He's the cult founder of the Northern Kingdom. There's another encounter Jacob has, and that's the second one in my little diagram, and we're going to look at that one. Because that's an identity story. And that's a nighttime story where he, he, has a, he fights all night long. That's, that's, in our, that's a genealogical story. We want to look at that one a little bit. So you ready to do this? Um, we're going to stay with the handout. That worked last week. You could follow that, couldn't you? Or Okay. Here we go. Rebecca and infertility. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam, sister of Laban, uh, of Laban, the Aramean. So, boom, he goes to Damascus to this old clan and, and marries into it, which is kosher, as you will see. It's a good thing to do. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife. Why? It's here, here the genealogy is going to stop. Boom. We're going to have to have some narratives. Because she was barren. Exactly the same thing that describes Sarah. And the Lord granted his prayer, and this thing kicks in big time, granted his prayer, and his wife Rebecca conceived. In the Abraham cycle, that takes chapters to get to Sarah to conceive. That is, the motif of infertility stays front and center. The Jacob cycle also has the problem of infertility, but it flips it on its head. What happens when you're too fertile? She went, uh, uh, let me read this. Uh, the, ch the children struggled within her. And she said, if it is this way, why am I living? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, this, there's a longer quote here, but I clipped it. Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples born of you shall be divided. So the problem here is infertility introduces the problem of too much fertility. And that's the problem of twins in the ancient world. Twins. Do you kill one? Um, is it a good thing? Romulus and Remus, eventually you kill one. Uh, th are they magical? They're not like me. Why are there two? Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of mythology around twins. Hmm? Twins are not normal. Is it an omen? Is it a good omen? Or, God forbid, is it the end of the world? Hmm. So that is looming behind us. Here we have twins. What do we do? How do we evaluate this surplus of fertility? When her time gave to give birth was at hand, and there were twins in her womb, the first came out red. All his body like a hairy mantle. I mean, this is, this is, we're going camping. Get your tent. So they named him Esau, hairy boy. Okay? He's hairy. Afterward, his brother came out. So who's the firstborn? Who's the eponymous? Esau is. Same problem with Ishmael. Who's really the eponymous ancestor? Ishmael. Here we come. We're coming right back, but we tighten the circle. Because the circle isn't now a slave in Sarah. The circle is Rebecca with twins. She's birthing them. 
uh, afterward, his brother came out, and what is he doing in the birth? This must not have been a happy moment for her. <laughs> They're fighting in the womb, and he is grabbing Esau's foot in the birthing chamber to do what? To <clears throat> get ahead of him, get ahead. And that act um, names him Yaakov in Hebrew, um, subplanter. This isn't going to be your best friend. And you certainly don't want to share a bank account with him. So you have Harry, who's kind of a straight shooter and is going to go camping with you. And then you got the wily Yaakov who's trying to figure out how to get you and get ahead of you. All right? So the Jacob cycle puts, tells a story about the power of names. Naming determines identity. I don't know if we do that that much anymore. Um, we used to. You would name a baby after a certain ancestor because you saw that personality in them. And, you know, once you do that, that poor kid's doomed. <laughs> because everybody's going to tell them what they're like. Well, the ancients believed this to the max. So we have Esau Harry and we have Yaakov, tricky subplanter. That's who they are now. Their personalities have just been given to you. And the closing line of that is, Esau, the hairy hunter, is loved by his father. He's a daddy's boy. And the little sly, sneaky Yaakov, Jacob, is, is a mama's boy. So we have this structure in this cycle of stories, not just Twins, which is itself mystical and dangerous, ambiguous. But the parents also line up. Jacob Esau, Isaac Esau, Jacob Rebecca. Okay, so now the story begins. Isaac and Esau don't stand a chance in this story. Not a chance. Why? Because Rebecca is the smartest of all of them three times hands down. Because of the clan she comes from. Isaac married up. And that Damascus crowd are, are people who don't lose out in things. Whatever it is, they're going to come out on top. And the myth that the story taps into at this point is what we call the trickster mythology. That is, you trick someone. Uh, you kind of sleaze them out of something. And they may not even know you did it to them. They may thank you for it. And so we get two tricks. Because in the birth canal, Jacob couldn't get what he wanted. Esau came out first. So the first trick is the theft of his birthright. If I couldn't get it in the canal, I'm going <laughs> I'm going to get it on Tuesday night at the dinner table. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, right? He's 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 a cook. He's in the kitchen. He's doing stuff. Esau came in from the field, and he was vanished. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff. All right? Now, red is tied into the meaning of his name. Esau means hairy, but Esau is the eponymous ancestor of the people known as the Edomites. And that means red people. 
if you've gone to the Middle East and you go to Aqaba and you cross over out of Israel and you go into Jordan and you drive north, if you, if you are there, do this. Leave Israel and do this. And drive north, you are in Edom. And you will see the most beautiful red rock. It goes on and on and on. Petra's down there. That's the name of the people who lived there back at the time of ancient Israel. They are the Edomites. They are the Red Rock people. And their eponymous ancestor is both hairy and red. So the names carry all the load in these stories. Uh, let me eat some of that red stuff or I'm vanished. Therefore, he's called Edom, Red. And Jacob said, well, sell me your birthright. It's an expensive meal. And Esau said, see, he's gruff. He's not thinking, he's not thinking two steps ahead. He's certain you could beat him at checkers. He couldn't even play chess. I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear first. Swear to me first. So he swore to him. He sold his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and he rose and he went his way. Kind of a gruff hunter, hungry, got his food, sold the family farm <laughs> for a pot of porridge. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So what Jacob couldn't do in the birthing canal he just did on Tuesday or Wednesday night over supper. And then the genealogy comes back at that point. And we are told Esau was 40 years old and he married Judith, daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basimot, daughter of Elon the Hittite. Hittites aren't good in the Bible. <laughs> I don't actually know who a Hittite is, but whoever they were, biblical writers don't like Hittites. And we're just told he married two. So his stock's going way down in this narrative. I mean, way down. If genealogies push you out or pull you in, he's just pushing himself out of this story in that genealogical statement. Now, hang on. The story's not over. Um, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Well, okay, Jacob's got the birthright, but there's this other mystical thing in the ancient world. Like we end the church, the church service with what we call the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And that just sort of kind of, that sort of marks the end of worship. In the ancient world, that is a mystical act, especially if done by clergy. That is, they can transfer substance to you. They have the power so the blessing, you don't give those casually. That's not like shaking hands. Uh, blessings are powerful. And because Esau is the primogenitor, he not only has the birthright, he's got the magical blessing. So Jacob's not done. He wants the magic. When Esau was old and blind and his eyes were dim so he couldn't see, he called his elder son Esau, whom he loves, now remember, and said, my son, and I clipped some stuff out, take your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out in the field and hunt game for me. Then prepare me a savory food such as I like and bring it to me to eat so that I can pass the magic Right? This is powerful, and it's going to come back in this story. So I can pass the magic on to you, and then I'll die. He doesn't die. Isaac doesn't get a lot of things right. <laughs> it's like that little big man movie when he says, Oh, little big man, it's a good day to die. <laughs> Goes up on the mountain, starts to rain. He says, Maybe not a good day to die. <laughs> now, Rebecca is eavesdropping. You don't want to go. You don't want to bet against this woman. She's listening at the door of the tent. Oh, the, the magic is going to be transferred. So Rebecca 
was listening, and she said to her son Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother Esau, blah, 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 blah. I took it out. And then this is a long section here I didn't put in. I want you to um, kill a lamb or a goat. I want you to make it kind of smelly the way your brother's kind of smelly because he's always hunting. I want you to put that on. I want you to put that on your shoulders so that you're kind of a hairy, smelly guy. And then I'm going to make that stew with wild animals. Right? So she's in on this trick. In fact, she's the one driving this trick. Um, and so he, Jacob, went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob says to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. So he came near and kissed him, and he smelled him. Oh, yeah, you smell, you smell like Esau. He smelled of his garments, and he passed the magic. Boom. And you can only do that once. You can't do half the bottle. It's an all-or-nothing deal, and Jacob just got it. And Esau said, is he... Rightly not named Yaakov, supplanter. Now Esau hated Jacob. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I'm going to kill the rascal. So we're getting character development. Gruff Esau is kind of living out his character. Just one step too late to most things. Jacob is living out his supplanter. And then just when we're really ready to write Esau off, we get the genealogy. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please his father Isaac, notice how he doesn't mention his mother. Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalat, daughter of Avram, Abraham's son Ishmael, sister of Nabaioth, to be his wife. His genealogy comes back in a bit here. Hittite women, out. Ishmael, back in. We're not done with Esau. We're not done with him. Scene two i got to keep moving. Are you following me? Yes. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Yes. Whew, I know. I'm going to be 71. All I've ever done my whole life is read these texts, and I still find them infinitely fascinating. Rebecca says, you know, your, your, your brother's going to kill you. I didn't give you any of that in the handout. And she says, you got to clear out, man. you you got to get out of town. I tell you what. Go to, go to my family. Travel north. Go to, go to the Arameans. Padam Aram. And hide out there. So that's what Jacob does. And on his way up there, that's where he has his dream. Uh, with his head on the rock and the Bethel thing. We're going to skip that. But here's the problem. This is sort of a come to Jesus moment for Jacob. Because... He's a pretty good trickster, but his mom can run circles around him, and he's now going to the A-team of tricksters. You see, he thought he was pretty good. He's going to get clobbered up north. He's going to get out-tricked over and over. Uh, he's just an apprentice. So he goes north, and we get a, 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 a woman at the well story. In the, in the Bible, Hebrew Bible, but also in the New Testament, Whenever a character sees a woman at the well, then you know you're going to have a marriage. That's a trigger for a marriage story. And Jacob gets north, and he sees, he sees this woman. I cut it out of my handout at the well. Her name is Rachel. Oh, my gosh, she's in love. She's just everything he can't imagine. So he says to Laban, 
Rachel's brother, I think. I forget. Brother, isn't it? I think, Lucy, brother. Let's go with brother. I will serve you. Yeah, because it's his uncle. So it's Rachel's brother. I mean, Rebecca's brother. I will serve you, Laban, seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Seven years. Then Jacob said to Laban, I've cut a lot of material out. Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is complete. He's worked seven years. Laban owes him. That was the contract. So Laban gathered to gather all the people of the place and threw a wedding. Now this is where it gets a little funky tricky. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. So he slept with the older daughter. Now the guy didn't know it. It kind of makes you wonder, who is this guy anyhow? But we're going to let that go. The narrator doesn't want, doesn't care about it, so we don't either. But when morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? See, he's a trickster. Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then did you deceive me? Laban said, blah, 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 blah. I took out a lot of text. We will give you the other also in return for serving me seven more years. The guy's got indentured servitude now 14 years because his uncle's a little slimy. Tricked him. Tricked the trickster. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban for another seven years and then the story gets into all these kids that are born is so interesting that the 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 children of Rachel and Leah and the the slave women it's the origin story of the 12 tribes pulled it out not important for us although it actually is because it's genealogical material okay there's another trick Jacob And Rachel trick Esau twice, two tricks on Jacob. Second trick is he wants to go home. He's had it 14 years. Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own home and country. But Laban said to him, watch the motif that comes back here. Be careful what you wish for. If you will allow me to say so, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. You see, Jacob's got the magic. Jacob's got the magic, and his uncle knows it. Now, the magic is always has to do usually with fertility. Name your wages, and I will give it. And Jacob said, okay, now he's, t- now he's stuck. Another, I don't know how many years the text doesn't say. Um, the wages will be the spotted and speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. That is, he gets all the freaky kind of fringe animals. He'll take the spotted and striped goats. I don't know how many of those there are. I'm not really on the cutting edge of goat. <laughs> And Laban said, the spotted, and, oh no, and Laban said, good, let it be as you said. But that day, Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted. So there, there ain't going to be any, there ain't going to be any pay for Jacob, right? Laban the trickster just made sure. But here's where things get a little, the blessing kind of comes back in kind of mystical ways. Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plain and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the rods. 
It's hard to even imagine what's going on here. And the flocks bred in front of the rods, so the flocks produced young that were striped, speckled, and spotted. That is, he's got the magic. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him as favorably, <laughs> that's an understatement, as he did before. All right? So now we're at the end of that middle section. Trickster tricks brother out of the, out of the firstborn and the blessing. Trickster family tricks Jacob in marriage, tries to do it around the theme of blessing, right? But can't. Blessing's too squiggly. Jacob can, can out-bless him move on. This is what we really want to get to. This is really the payload. We got, what happened to Esau? That's really the mother load of the story. That's what the genealogy is about. So let's go back to it. Jacob now is traveling back home. And the reason he left is that the closing line of Esau was, I'm going to kill that punk. I'm going to kill him. That's still hanging in the background. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Sa'ir. That's south. That's where all that red mud is we were talking about. The country of Edom. Instructing them, thus you will say to my lord Esau, I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female slaves and and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. He's trying to buy, buy him off. Right? So he's, he's approaching him conflictually. Because that's how he's defined their relationship. He's a supplanter. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau. We, we got him. We found him. And uh, by the way. He is coming to meet you with 400 men. Okay? In the ancient world, David had 400 men, and he conquered most of the world with them. Abraham had 400 men, and he literally conquered the world. So this is not a casual statement. This is a problem. Then Jacob was greatly afraid, for good reason, and distressed, and now he's responding as the trickster, as the survivor, as the conflictual person. He, he divided the people that were with him, the flocks, the herds, and the camels, into two companies. Thinking, if Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company to that is left will escape. At least he'll sneak out of here with something. So he's living out his name. He's the Yaakov. He's, he's living this out. He's, gonna, he's not going to go down in this battle. He's going to subplant his brother. He's got two companies now. Somebody's going to sneak away. So he, Jacob, spent the night there, and, and from what he had with him, he took a present. Here he goes. He's going to try and buy him off again. To his brother Esau, for he thought, hmm, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterwards, stay with this line. I will see his face. Hmm? I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. That is, he can buy his way into favor when he sees his face. Okay, now zero in on this next story. It's a transitional story. Bob and Goon, you're going to love this story because it's psychological. Jacob was left alone, okay? Now, Jacob's alone, and it's a nighttime story. Nighttime stories are not good stories. They're mystical evil, usually. Uh, and Jacob was left alone, and a man, an Ish in Hebrew, attacked him and wrestled with him until daybreak. So it's a nighttime drama. 
And Jacob is pretty strong. He's an eponymous ancestor. He's kind of like a Hercules kind of character. Whoever this Ish is doesn't seem to land the blow that needs to be landed. And when the Ish, the man, saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he's got magic too. He struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So this Ish is not strong enough to out-wrestle Jacob. But he's got a few tricks of his own. Puts his, puts his hip out of joint. Who is this Ish? This nighttime creature. What's going on here? Then he said, let me go. Because day is breaking. It's like a vampire statement. Ah, I will melt. I will melt. It's a creepy story. But Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go <laughs> unless you bless me. You see, he's greedy. <laughs> unless you bless me. So then he said to him, now this is all, this whole cycle of stories is a story of names. Names are your identity. And Jacob gets tricked by this nighttime wrestler. Because Jacob wants, he wants something out of this. And he wants it so badly that he falls for the trap. What's your name? You don't give your name. Because that's the essence of who you are. You don't reveal that. You reveal that, you are exposed. What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the Ish, the man said, I got you now. I got you. You revealed yourself to me. And now this Ish has the power to change his personality. Take him over. Invade him. You'll no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Right? You do a name change in the Hebrew Bible, and now you, you have gone through deep psychotherapy. You are someone else. For... You have striven with God and with humans, and you have prevailed. Now the name of deity comes in, but who's the Yish? If the writer wanted us to, to, to make this transparent, then it would be God who attacked him. That's not what the writer says. A nighttime Yish attacked him, a nighttime man. But in explaining his name change, this Ish defines the new character infused in Jacob. Throw Jacob away. You are Israel. The name Israel means God wrestler. Yitzra, to, to wrestle. Who are you wrestling? El, God. All right? So it seems like maybe the Ish is God. But this is a weird God because this God is a night demon. Right? It's divine, but it can't see sunlight. Stay with the story. Early in my career, we, we, when we used to do tradition history, that is, you'd push these stories back as far as you could into uh, legend, then we would interpret this. And if like, you read Gerhard von Rod's commentary in Genesis, he'd say, yes, this is an old tribal nocturnal legend about a night demon. It's a demonic story. But it has been pulled into the genealogical structure, and now it's become ambiguous. I don't know if that's true. I'm less confident about those readings, but there it is. You see the ambiguity in the story. Whoever this character is can't see sunlight. Well, in the Hebrew Bible, God is often sun. <laughs> so, so... Go with the story a minute. Then Jacob asked him, well, listen, I gave you my name. What's your name? Who are you? And this creature doesn't take the bait. 
Why do you want to know my name? Doesn't give it. Overpowers him in the trick. And there he blessed him. So Jacob gets more of the magic from whoever this was. So Jacob called the place, in his mind, Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face. He didn't see anybody. This is a nighttime story. This is all taking place in the dark. He's given you an interpretation now. I have seen God face to face, and I'm still alive. The sun rose upon him, now it's sunlight, and as he passed Penuel, face of God, that's the place, limping, right, he lost his hip socket, of his hip, and then we get a kosher law. Some later writer comes in and says, you know, that's why we don't eat hip bone. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the, the thigh muscle that is in the hip socket because he, whoever he is, struck Jacob on the, on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. So that's a kosher law. That, that, that could be over, over in the book of Leviticus. Okay, stay with me now. Now our, our character went through a nocturnal transformation. ambiguous, but it's a nocturnal transformation, comes out wounded and renamed. Thinking, hmm, I saw God. The narrator never tells us it's God. And in the Hebrew Bible, the narrator's got to tell you. If the narrator doesn't tell you, don't bet on it. Let's read on. We're almost to the end. Now Jacob looked up, and who does he really see in the daylight? Esau. That's who he sees. Coming with 400 men with him. Now, this Esau, who the last comment we had was trying to figure out a way to kill him, runs up to him, hugs him, falls on his neck, kisses him, and cries like a baby. We're in the world of genealogy. Who's in, who's out? How does this all work? Who's in the group, who's out of the group? Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? That is, all these gifts that keep coming at me in waves. And Jacob answered, to find favor with my Lord. And Esau said, right, this whole thing is about, this whole thing is an, is an economics of scarcity. There's one birthright, there's one blessing, who gets it? Who doesn't get it? Esau leaves the world of scarcity. He didn't get the birthright. He didn't get the blessing. And what does he say? I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have. So we've left that first scene. We've gone. Esau's left that first scene. But what about our character, Jacob? And Jacob said, oh, no, please. If I find favor with you, then accept the present from my hand because I'm afraid you're going to kill me now? That's no. The next line is, a, is, is, I think, one of the key lines in this cycle. For truly to see your face, to see your face, is like seeing the face of God. So who was that wrestler? What's going on in that nighttime transformation story? 
Who was that Ish that Jacob interprets as, as God who somehow can't see the light? The guy needs to read his catechism. Or is that Esau? You see? This is so unusual in the Hebrew Bible to have such a deeply psychological story. That's why I singled it out for you, Bob and Goon. It's just so unusual because Hebrew is not an internal language. It doesn't explore the internal and characters. It doesn't even have the means to do it. Yet this little story probes so deeply into character, internal character, through setting time. <clears throat> To see your face is like seeing the face of God since you have received me with such favor. So now, now relationships are starting to form which were conflictual. Please accept my gift that is brought to you. Why? Not so you don't kill half my camp and the other half can get away. God's been good to me. I too have everything I want. Ah. Okay, the problem of too much potency and the danger of twins has run its arc in what was zero-sum game has now become, eh, I love you, you love me, I have enough, you have enough. We can move back to genealogy. Jacob came to his father Isaac, who didn't die, right? at Mamre, or Kiriot Arba, that is Hebron, and Isaac breathed his last. That is, Isaac doesn't actually die till the end of this whole cycle. And he was gathered to his people, old and full of years, and who buries him? The two sons. You see Esau's back in the story. He's back in the story. The same way Ishmael, back in the story, jointly buries um, Abram. Right? Uh, and then, now that we've reached resolution, we've solved the problem of twins, of too much fertility, we can go back to stasis. And what we get is an incredible, incredibly long genealogy of Esau, that is Edom, and go read it. It is long and complex, which tells you how important this character is. And when we flip back to Jacob, we, in verse 37 of Genesis, Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. And this is the genealogy of the family of Jacob. And you, you think you're going to now have stasis? Oh, no. Oh, no. Because those 12 offspring, it becomes a interfamily fight to the death. And that becomes the Joseph cycle of stories that ends the book of Genesis. And it becomes brothers plot. This is like succession, which is going to start again this month. Um, it's um, plotting to kill the pampered boy, Joseph, who's, who's the favorite, who's got the multicolored coat. Who stays home with daddy while the brothers are out working? And one day daddy says, you know, go out there and, I don't know, <laughs> either bring him lunch or tell him to take care of those goats. And they hate this kid. And they say, you know what? Today is the day we finally kill that little shrimp. They dig a hole and they don't kill him. They fake his death. Hmm? It's all this conflict between these brothers. They fake his death, and they sell him to 
into slavery into Egypt. You see how it's a reverse salvation story? And who, who helps these brothers get this kid to Egypt? Ishmaelites. <laughs> so it's a whole, I mean, it's the whole gang shows up again. And now we get sort of a reverse Exodus story for a while where our, he's not a very lovable character, Joseph, then ends up, ends up getting raped by a woman and blah, 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 and eventually he rules Egypt. So read that. But that's all genealogical material. It's the disruption of the genealogy which reaches resolution at the end of the Joseph cycle where the brothers hug, forgive, and boom, we move on to the Exodus because they're in Egypt now. Things aren't going to go so well. And that Joseph character actually marries an Egyptian princess so that his two kids, see, this all gets very complicated. His two kids, who are Ephraim and Manasseh, are, have Egyptian mothers. And these writers are saying, well, who's in our story? Who's in the genealogy? Who can potentially be a character? And they're starting to build the boundaries bigger and bigger. And we're going to quit there. Isn't it cool? You've got to admit. How can you lose? Think of your own family. But this becomes scripture. How do you read this authoritatively? These authors want you to see ambiguity, tension, um, and they want you to frame the kingdom of God as this complex genealogy. I'm going to quit there. What thoughts? I talked the whole darn time. I didn't mean to do that. Why does it become scripture? Yeah, well, there you go. There you go. Um, what are these writers struggling with? They're struggling with inclusivity. They're struggling, I mean, all the issues we struggle with. Who are the people of God? How narrowly are you going to define that? Who, who could be in? Who could be out? Uh, that's, that's front and center to the writing of this literature. And if you're having trouble, here's a model of how you might deal with it. And then the stories become paradigmatic. Oh, you hate your brother? Oh, you're a wily character? Uh, read Jacob. You too could meet a night demon. <laughs> you too could be transformed. Now, now you're into authoritative literature. Paradigmatic literature. <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm a twin and I'm going home and thinking. <laughs> I know you're a twin. I'm going to reassess what's going on. Are you Jacob or are you Esau? <laughs> who is the night demon? Uh, yeah. I mean, who do you think it was? I think the writer has written an intentionally so that you don't answer it. There's probably three or four right answers simultaneously. Could, it, it's never identified as Yahweh. So kosherness is out the window. Uh, El, El is a divine name, but it's highly generic is in the story. Um, that it's nocturnal. Ancient Israelites, nocturnal stories. See, we have a nocturnal story that's kind of positive. Uh, Jesus, uh, Monday Thursday, then you go nocturnal. But nocturnal is demonic. Nocturnal. And then you come up for sunrise, that's Easter. Well, that's kind of this story is doing that. Once you go nocturnal, you're, you're kind of demonic. Um, that's true with Passover. That's a demonic story. Um, so it doesn't let you answer. It, it's many possibilities, which is good analysis, right, Bob and Goon? There's not one answer. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it good? Yeah. So are you suggesting that the world of dreams is primal? Um, well, that's not a dream, is it? That's told as a narrative, but you could interpret it. It's one of the few stories you can pull that off in. You could interpret that as a dream. 
And what makes it stronger is if you took a story we didn't look at, that is Jacob has two divine encounters. The other one at Bethel, which is a dream. So that makes you think, oh, I am in the dream world. Even though this story doesn't say it's a dream. This story externalizes a battle. But his first encounter is explicitly called a dream. So you see, it gets, it gets layered, doesn't it? Is Rebecca alive at the end? No, she dies giving... Where does she die, Jane? She does not go back for her funeral. I, I might have pulled it. She dies. Does she die in Hebron? She's buried there. If you go to Hebron, that's where. I don't know where she dies, Jane. I forget. But I pulled the material. You could look that up, and I. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Is there any relevance to the fact that the man of the night gave him the name Israel? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that trends that character towards a divine power. Well, and so does the magical ability to touch somebody's hip. This isn't your average shepherd who happened to be there. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So that's our course. Excellent. Ancestors. Thank you so much, Tom.